What's going on rail fans? Welcome back to the Etobicoke Central Railways. I thought I'd try something a little bit different this time and go a bit off script and show you around the new layout design I recently finished on any rail. So as you can see, here's the existing layout and the two tables. I've managed to accurately design the existing track work to exact measurements. And if I scroll south, you can see what I've been up to for the last week. I have to admit, it's been a bit tricky trying to maximize the use of space, but I think I found a good balance and I didn't saturate the entire space with rails running all over the place. One of the first tasks was to try and figure out a good way of curving the main line from Parkdale East and into the other main line heading south. Because of the direction, this section between this switch and this switch will be an isolated block set up as a reverse loop so we won't have any power issues since this design does create a loop back off the existing layout. A little fact that many ECR viewers might not know is that the existing track work on the original layout is code 100 rail on the outside main line. The inner rails and diamond crossing in Parkdale are all code 83. Now I know many of you would point out that code 100 rail is not your prototypical rail of choice, but we had a few older train sets in the collection with oversized European flanges and rather than changing those we thought we would have a universal code of rail at least on the main line. With that said, you can't even tell where the code of rail transitions. We've used a Walther's Code 100 to Code 83 6 inch transition track. It's a really smooth transition. Since the new layout branches off of Code 100 rail, we'll be installing two transition pieces here and here. I definitely want it to be more prototypical on the new layout using Code 83 rail. Let's take a look at a new district. East Bayfront, loosely modeled after Queen's Key East in the area around the Red Path Sugar Refinery in downtown Toronto. Recently, I came across a set of photos taken by fellow train enthusiast John Vincent. Years back, John photographed switching moves by CP into the Red Path facility, and it sparked a load of interest for the area. I remember when I was younger, CP would have a set of 3,800 cubic foot hoppers on the sidings, and the spur would run right along Queen's Key. The spur to Red Path was ripped up in the early 2000s. As you can see, I have a similar idea with the same approach into Red Path as you saw in the photos. This is going to be an exciting section to work on, plus it's right at the front of the table. It'll be one of the first scenes you'll see when you walk into the room. In terms of layout control, I was going to keep things simple and install a UR90 control panel from Digitrax. The UR90 has two control options. I can plug in a hand throttle directly or use the built-in infrared option. The room itself is not that big, so I don't think I'll have any issues with line of sight while using the infrared. I'll be sticking with my Zephyr Extra as my command station as well as the JMRI software for additional programming and throttles. Installing a booster seems slightly overkill for a layout of this size. The Zephyr has more than enough amps to run multiple locomotives. Finally, let's take a look at the new yard and roundhouse. So for the yard, I'm using MicroEngineering's yard ladder system switches. It's really helped cutting down on space and it made a lot of extra room between the sidings. The longest pieces of track are over 40 inches, five sidings in total. I managed to incorporate my Aaron Canning Company building on the far east end, being serviced by two spurs. Since space is limited, I'll have bays one and two in the roundhouse designated as shop and repair bays, while the rest will be used for locomotive storage. I'll have a couple of classic roundhouse essentials like an abandoned coaling tower and a couple of sanding towers. The turntable itself is still a bit of a question mark. Do we go old school and use a hand crank, or use a slowly geared motor on a toggle switch to rotate the table? So that's where I'm at. I'll move on to a wiring diagram next and place a few switch machines and plan for the reverse loop and signals. I'll more than likely keep the larger yard on manual throws and put the main switches on slow motion switch machines. I'll keep everyone updated on my progress. Always interested to read your comments on the build and don't forget to subscribe for the very latest.